Well, thank you very much, Leandro, um, for inviting me along tonight to talk to Amber View uh, about inflation. Inflation's been one of those uh, things that has been a pet interest of mine for the last two or three years. And I'm just publishing uh, my second book uh, about it called Inflation Matters, which is coming out in a, in a couple of weeks' uh, time. Um, but what, what inspired me to write this latest book is by looking back into time and looking at inflation past. And I'm not just talking about looking back maybe a decade or, or a century, but actually looking back millennia. I started reading a fascinating book by a guy called David Hackett Fisher called The Great Wave. And in it, he talks about how inflation isn't just a recent phenomenon, but it's been happening right back to Mesopotamian times. And one of the charts uh, that he puts in his book uh, is, is a version of this one here, which shows you the rise of prices in Roman times. And I expect many of you are probably aware of what happened at the end of the second century and into the third century in Rome, where Roman emperors gradually debased the currency and reduced the amount of silver in coins from 95% down to virtually nothing, and a massive inflation ensued. But what you might not be aware of is actually that there were two other periods of inflation in Rome, which happened before that in the Roman Republic time. And the, uh, the first one happened around 300 to 250 BC. Interestingly enough, almost at the same time that there were increases in Greece and also in Mesopotamia. And then there was another one at the end of the Republic itself, around 50 BC. But what's interesting when you look at this chart is it says four things to me. First is, over time, prices are going up. Secondly, when they go up, they don't go up in a straight line. They seem to follow some sort of wave-like pattern. And the, th the third thing is that there seems to be a, that pattern and that wave seems to have a period of around about two or three hundred years. And lastly, over time, the increases are getting bigger and bigger. And what's interesting is that when you then start to look at, you scroll forward another millennia, and if you look at this chart, this is the data from the UK from uh, around 1250 AD. There was some pioneering work done by a couple of academics in the 1950s, Sir Henry Phelps Brown and Sheila Hopkins, who managed to construct an approximate price index for the UK by looking at household records uh, from stately homes in southern England and universities. And this is basically what they found. And what I find fascinating looking at this chart is that it's almost the same as the Roman one. What you see are the same four things. You see prices going up over time. You see it following a wave-like pattern of them going up, consolidating, going up, consolidating. And that, that period of that is around 200 or so, 300 years. And also that over time, the increases are getting bigger. Indeed, the very first one, the first bit on the, on the chart here, the increase per year is about half a percent a year. The next one is 1% a year, the next one is 2% a year, and in the latest block, which we're in now, it's 4% a year, exponentially increasing. So I set myself thinking, what is causing this? Because at my heart, I suppose I'm a monetarist, is this all to do with just the, va the amount of money being created out there? And I actually started thinking that I don't think that is the case. I think it's actually more complex than that. And in terms of like inspiration for my thinking, I'd like to turn to a guy called Robert Malthus. Some of you may well have uh, remember him. In fact, some of his Malthusian theories have been somewhat discredited over time, but he was very much a believer in the importance of population and how it affected the economy. He was writing right back, if we just sit back to that last chart, he was writing at the peak the last big inflationary peak that this country has saw. And he wrote in 1798 an essay on the effect of population. And in it, he was saying that what causes issues in the economy is, is growth of the population, because the population has the ability to grow exponentially. And yet, we as humans have the ability to only increase production arithmetically. And it's the difference between those and the effect on demand 
that causes a whole load of problems. And clearly in days gone by, um, those problems were often solved by, by wars and famine and things like that. And it, it, if you have a look at this chart, which is effectively what Malsus was thinking at the time, which compares the UK change in population in 50-year bands versus change in prices in 50-year bands, it very much supports his view. There is a strong correlation between population growth and inflation in the UK. So with that in mind, I've been thinking this through and I've come through with what I describe as being a new theory on inflation, which I call inflationary wave theory. And what I'm saying is, is that what, explaining, what is explaining those graphs that you've seen is an underlying trend here. And that underlying trend is one of demand. And the key factor that's influencing that demand is population. And that's what's driving prices up inexorably up over a long period of time. But it doesn't go in a straight line. And it doesn't go in a straight line for a whole load of reasons, because clearly population doesn't go up in a straight line or even exponentially up. But the main thing is that it seems to follow a step-like plan because of the intervention of man. Once man picks up that an inflation has started, he then starts creating other factors that cause that trend to get exaggerated. And we'll talk more about those in a minute. But there does come a point, though, when you hit a tipping point and it's got too far away from the trend and it has to come back and consolidate to it. And if you think about it, that is extremely similar to what we see every day in the finance world. Literally this afternoon, I took this chart uh, of Domino's pizza price off the web and it shows exactly the same thing. You've got an underlying trend there of growth of the share price, presumably determined by them opening up more branches and franchises for pizzas. But it doesn't go in a straight line. It follows the same zigzag pattern that we've seen with populations. So let's have a look at this in a bit more detail. What is going on with these man-made factors and inflationary mindset, and how does it work? Well, I believe what happens is, is that once the demand factors start to show themselves in, by increases in commodities, the smart people in in the world spot it and they decide they've got to do something about protecting their wealth in this inflationary world and the smart people realize not just to protect their wealth but they can actually gain from this inflation so what do you do in that circumstance the key thing is you do is you go buy land and you buy property and moreover you go go get a loan to buy them because you know that that loan is going to get eroded by inflation but the mere fact of borrowing that loan means that you create money and that money increases the money supply which then feeds through to increase prices and you create start to create this vicious circle of man-made inflation but it doesn't stop there that increase of money creates a buzz in the economy it causes the economy to take off other people around it spot what what these guys are up to, they want to join in on the party as well. So they borrow more money and feed the thing even more. Governments spot what's going on and say, hey, this is clever. We can, we can offer more things to our population and we don't ever have to pay for them. We can let inflation erode away the costs of all the benefits we're providing. So that is the inflationary mindset that you end up with. And just to sort of show you how important that is, and you know, in terms of the money supply, have a look at this graph. This shows you a comparison of UK price index, which is the line in blue, together with uh, the dotted line, which is the UK money supply. And what I've done on the UK money supply index is to take off it GDP growth, because clearly you need... What, so what effectively that line is showing you is the excess money that's been created in the economy, which is not needed uh, for the economy itself. And what's incredible is that the fit is almost one for one. For every 1% excess money supply that's being created, prices go up 1%. And you can see that over time, the line is not perfect. There were periods like in the 1930s where velocity of money went down. So therefore, it undershot for a brief period. And similarly, after the Second World War, due to shortages. But you've got other periods in like the 70s where people just started spending loads of money because they could see the inflation and it got above the line. 
But I think what's interesting is where we are now. And I'm going to come back to this later on. But right at the moment, money supply over the last 20 or 30 years has grown significantly greater than retail prices. That money has gone into housing, into the usual places, into other assets such as shares and that. But there is now a gap of approximately 100%. Prices need to double to catch that up. I'm not saying they necessarily will, and we'll come back to that later. So returning back to the inflationary waves, this chart summarises how long the inflationary part of the wave and how long the consolidation waves have lasted in the past. Over recent times, the inflationary waves have lasted anywhere between about 80 and 140 years. We are 115 years currently into the latest cycle. So all logic suggests, if history has some form of repeating, that at some point in the next few decades, we will reach the end of the current cycle, if not before. And in terms of the consolidation, that that may well last at least another 80 years. So in other words, what I'm saying is, is that for the vast majority of the 21st century and into the 22nd century, prices in this country will stay largely stable. But what's interesting is that the transition point in the past has never been a simple one. If you think about it, you've got to change the country's mindset from inflation to deflation. And there's the, in the past, there's been some sort of calamity that has caused that change of mindset. In, you know, it, historically, it could have been sort of famine or, or um, population climb, things like the Black Death, and English Civil War, 30 World War in Europe. But there's a whole load of things on the Napoleonic War. There's been something major instant that has caused it to happen. And also linked to that, when, when the trend changes, it's usually followed by a decline of prices by about approximately a half in a period of four to eight, nine years. So this is basically some def massive deflationary shock needs to come through to change the psyche of um, humans. And if you have a look here, which sort of lists my little summary chart really of what happens in the consolidation wave, you can see the final big burst of prices, this deflationary shock, and then obviously the response by governments to that deflationary shock pushes prices back up, but they never get above the levels they were before. And things gradually oscillate, and they oscillate downwards as um, technological and productivity improvements reduce the costs of things over time. So if you look where we are now in the world, I've done here a simple chart uh, highlighting the factors that are affecting near-term inflation in the UK and other key economies. And you can see it's very much balanced in favour of deflation. On the positive inflationary side, we've only got three factors. We've got central banks, like Mario Draghi last week, agreeing to print loads of money. We have um, long-term low interest rates, which is clearly trying to stimulate the economy. And of course, we've got governments. I mean, our government encourages inflation. It has train fare rises every year. It's been increasing the cost of education. Until recently, it's been presiding over above inflation rises for for, for utilities as well. So, and you know, we have it built into the system. But on the deflationary side, there is a whole stack of things. Not only do we have technological improvements, it's my belief that we're only just starting to see the impact of uh, the internet and changing ways of business models in terms of costs. But we have declining commodity prices. That's what's driven down uh, inflation rates around the world to near zero levels. We have the overhang of the financial crisis. We have a whole set of competitive devaluations. We've got the slowdown in China's economic growth, deciding to focus more internally. And we still have those continued uh, flood of cheap products coming in from other countries in the Far East. Add to that the overhang of the 2008 crisis and stagnant economies around years, austerity measures. But of course, the big factor in my view is population. And if you have a look at what's been happening to population numbers, I think this chart, uh, which I stole from a report um, put out by Deutsche Bank the other year, talk, looks at the fertility rates around the world over the last 50 years. And it shows the staggering decline in them. 
If you think about it, the average woman has to have just over two kids to keep the population the same. And in fact, I think the official figure is you need 2.3 because of infant mortality. But in, in Western countries, the figure is closer to two. And if you look down these numbers where we are now, there are very few nations in the world. There are virtually no developed nations where, where the number is above two. And it's, it, you know, it, most of Southeast Asia, um, if not all of it, South America, have all got rates below two. It's only Africa which has higher rates. And as we know, they're not a major contributor to global consumption. So this is going to feed through as we go through this next century to overall declining populations. But we're not seeing it yet because people are living longer. And indeed, if you carry on and you look further into Deutsche Bank's report, they reckon it have to be to about 2050 before the world hits peak population. But having said that, the effects are already here. Because of older people, old, um, older people consume less. I mean, if you just look at this chart, which shows you the age profile, I don't know how many of you are familiar with these age profile charts, but typically in days gone by, they used to be like pyramids. In other words, there were loads of people bored at the bottom and gradually, uh, as people get older, more and more people die. So you end up with like a pyramid type shape. The Japan one looks more like a Japanese pagoda, actually got very few people at the bottom and there's a big bulge of people uh, born in the 1670s and another one um, at nearer the top of the pagoda of people born post-war through to a tail at the top and in time this is you know scroll forward another 50 years and this is going to go back to being much more like a pyramid and that has major implications because those older people consume much less this is the demand shock that we are going to see coming through in the world economy. Now, the only thing that's, you know, you might think, well, okay, well, is this going to happen tomorrow? The answer is I don't think it will happen tomorrow. And the reason it's not going to happen tomorrow is because of guys like Mario. They are printing massive amounts of money to try and stave this off. Do I think they will succeed? No, I think the 7.5 billion of the world population and their demand will, in the end, outrun these guys but in the short term they're going to do their damnness to ensure that the world economy does not uh, decline by by throwing money at it and indeed who knows they might even in the short term create much higher levels of inflation QE is an imprecise art who knows it might even end up with quite sharp levels of inflation before we finally hit this tipping point I mean if you look at it I've highlighted here a number of reasons that might cause inflation to return, not just QE, it could be government policy. Maybe the next Labour government will decide they're going to give pay rises to the whole NHS and everyone else. Quite likely, we could end up with a wage price spiral. I think it's not un at all unlikely that commodity prices will go back up after they've come down to really low levels. Logic suggests they will go back up at some point. And who knows, there could even be a boom in the economy. Maybe, maybe the central bankers' policy will work and the low interest rates and we end up with a boom. Or, or failing that, people just lose faith in the currencies. We've seen that in Russia. And velocity of money goes up at that point and inflation does. So all of those things are possible. But if you think about it, you know, there, there has to be something quite momentous to happen to change the world's mindset towards inflation. And to try and help me work out, well, what might be the conditions that might bring that back? I've been reading what I think is a really fascinating book um, by a guy called Ronald Marx. He wrote it under the pen name of um, Genzo Parsons, I think it is. It's called Dying of Money. He wrote it in 1974 at the peak of inflation around the world. And he draws parallels between that time and other hyperinflations like in the Weimar Republic. And he concludes that there's basically three things that you need to do to stop an inflation. And I'm not saying that you know, necessarily his conditions will apply for us at this turning point, but they might do. And they're a reasonable hypothesis, because if we don't comply with these, inflation's going to come back. So the first one he talks about is that you need to create some system to stop the money supply increasing. And you could argue that maybe the case of 
where banks are at the moment, they're so crippled in places around Europe that they're not lending that much. But on the other hand, we've got central bankers pouring money in there. So I don't think we've met that condition. Now, the second factor is latent inflation. Marx thinks that you need to extinguish all latent inflation. And if you remember back to the chart I showed you right back at the beginning, in the UK at the moment, the money supply approximately is much higher than the current retail prices. So prices are either going to have to double or alternatively, we're going to have to destroy the money supply down to meet it. We'll come and discuss which of those will ha might happen in a minute. My personal view is probably the latter. Um, and the last one is that debts need to be restructured to a sustainable level. We're clearly nowhere near that at the moment. Worldwide debts are absolutely enormous. I mean, I was looking at some data the other day for the UK and the average total UK debt per, per, per household in this country, when you add up not just government, but personal um, corporate debt is around £300,000. The average income of each household in this country after tax is £30,000. That is clearly an unsustainable level of debt. And at some point, this has got to unwind. So what are some scenarios that could bring those three factors into alignment? I think there is potentially a good scenario. We could adopt something like the Chicago plan. For those of you who might know or re those who don't remember what it is, it was an idea brought up by academics at Chicago University in the late 1930s. In response to the crisis that happened then, they demanded reform of the way money was created. So instead of it being created by private banks, it should be created at a fixed amount by the government in proportion to the needs of the economy. And at the same time, they proposed to sort out the existing monetary system by writing off government debts and also writing off private debts as well. So you can quickly see that those sort of scenarios would probably comply with those conditions. Will it happen? To me, I don't think it's got a chance in hell of happening really partly because of a problem of things like collective action. It's just never going to happen. The, the, the powers that be it, who are most influential in society are probably never going to allow that to happen. So what's a more negative scenario that might bring these things about? To me, the most likely one is a bond market crisis. If you think what I'm talking about here is the traditional safe asset, which we all invest in, which our pension funds are all heavily invested in, is government debt and to a lesser extent corporate debt. If there was to be a big fright and plight from that area, it could create a domino effect, as I say on here, that will go through quite all the way through the financial system. And let's face it, Greece this week, <laughs> what are they saying? They're saying they're not going to pay back their debt. So, you know, who knows? We might be closer to this scenario than, than, than I think we are. Um, but if it does happen, I reckon it could destroy um, money on an enormous scale uh, around the world. So it would comply with dealing with latent inflation. It would end up restructuring the debts. And, and the losses would be so colossal that I reckon it's not impossible that it would force a new world order in terms of how money is created. And who knows, that monetary system might end up being based on something more modern. Instead of it being gold, we could end up with something based on blockchain. It'd never be Bitcoin, but it could well be something based on some digital money, something that stops and controls the amount of money that can be created in the world. So let's think about this new uh, near, near zero inflation world. Let's go beyond that turbulent transition period into where we end up beyond it for the rest of the century. Arguably, I think that could be quite a positive time. Um, Hackett Fisher, in his book, The Great Wave, talks about in previous waves, those have been associated with very positive times for, for economies and countries, like the Renaissance happened then, the period of enlightenment were all in, in these periods. And if you think about it, in terms of one of the key implications will be in terms of inequality and wages. If prices are continually stable, if not declining, no one's going to get a wage rise each year. There will be no cost of living rise. And that's going to be quite difficult for people to take. Because at the moment, when people get a cost of living rise, they tend to attribute it 
to their own, even though it's cost of living, they still think it's actually to do with them. The only way in this new world you're going to get a pay rise is by increasing your productivity or by going to seek a different job and upskilling to get a better job. Arguably, those are really good things for society anyway. But it does mean that over time, there's a real incentive for the first time for people to actually earn more, genuinely earn more money. And at the same time, prices will be gradually going down. So people will be better off. And add to that, the only reason why equality will get sorted out is that there will be such massive wealth destruction in the transition period that the problems that Piketty highlighted will suddenly go back into reverse. But I also think it would be good for businesses as well. A number of other people have written on this subject. Professor Selgin wrote um, a great book a couple of years ago over the benefits to companies of having a near zero inflation world. It's those more stable economic conditions without booms and busts make it much easier to plan a business. It's much easier to understand what is genuine increase. Part of the problem with companies like Tesco's is that they're Profits were being flattered by inflation. Take inflation away, and you suddenly realise the emperor's clothes, and that was the you know one of the key issues with um, with them. But add to that, you know, if you've got no inflation, you don't need to keep changing your prices. Shoe leather costs, is it called? I suspect we'll get rid of the destruction. will get rid of a load of zombie companies. The whole business environment should be a lot more positive. One of the other implications of that world, though, is governments are going to have to think through how they raise taxes. At the moment, they are collecting a very subtle inflation tax on people. In my book, I estimate it's up until um, 2013 was worth around about 30 billion a year. They're going to have to find another source for that money. You know, the direct replacement would be to say that everyone who's got cash or anyone who's got savings just pays the government 2% a year. I somehow think that may not be politically acceptable or a great campaign thing. So they're going to have to come up with something more subtle than that. Who knows what it could be? It could be probably some other form of capital tax. And I wouldn't be at all surprised if it's got something to related to, to death duties. But we'll see. But they've got to think about that. But man, I want to last end up on, though, thinking about what are the implications of if this theory is right and the broad pattern of inflation over the, over the coming couple of decades? How do you manage your wealth during that time? Because it's going to be a complex time because we've almost got like three different worlds going out there. The first world, the world we're in now, is the lowflation world where central banks are going to keep interest rates low. They're going to keep flooding the economy with cheap money uh, uh, and printing. And that merry go round of printing is probably going to go around another, another couple of times. Who knows? So that's going to be good for shares. It's going to be good for other assets like property. It's going to be terrible for cash. Anyone who holds cash is going to be, in, you know, see the value of it significantly eroded over the coming decades. Um, but all of that changes. When we hit, if the transition is a calamitous one that I'm fearing could happen, there's going to be a massive destruction of wealth. So all of those assets that have done particularly well, things like property, shares and bonds, are all going to get uh, completely destroyed at that pivot point. And you might think, well, okay, well, I'll just hold cash. But even cash is not going to be safe then. So you might think holding cash in this time is going to be a great thing to do. But even that, I question, because governments have already made it very clear they're going to be bailing in holders of cash. Even the £85,000 limit of, uh, from the financial compensation scheme, that may not even hold in, the, in this period. And those who think holding gold is going to be the answer, there's issues there too. Who's to say that governments won't put restrictions on them? Also, a lot of gold is held as paper gold. Is that going to hold up in, in, in this crisis? I don't know. And so, so you've got that period. And then what happens in the final period when we get for the rest, when we get through all that into the consolidation phase? I would argue then that we're in a world of near zero inflation, probably the average inflation rate being about minus one over time. So what's going to happen? I think you'll see virtually no capital growth on shares. But what you will see is dividends. So you'll probably see 2 to 3% a year dividends. Add that to 
deflation at minus 1%, maybe minus 2. And hey, presto, you've got a yield of around 4 or so percent, which is actually what it's been over the last century. But there, you've had to take inflation off it. And also savings and, and borrowings. If you're positively lending over a period of time to businesses, again, I think there will be some returns. But for things like property and bonds, I don't think you'll get anything. And, and gold, which probably will have spiked up in price during the transition period, will then collapse as well. So one of the key takeouts from this is really what happens to money. And my view is this, that money will revert to being a method of exchange and a store of value. No longer will it be possible to make money by having money, or at least it's not totally true, but it will be less so than it was in the past. So on this chart here, I've just quickly summarised um, really what the impact of these future inflation scenarios are on different types of wealth. And pluses mean it's good, minuses mean it's bad, and double minus means it's very bad. And, and, and you can see that the problem is, is that if you are following a traditional policy of buy and hold any type of asset, it's not going to work. You're going to have to be much more nimble than that over the coming years. So with that, I would like to round up and thank you very much for asking me to talk here. And just as a sort of a final reminder, um, if you want to know more about it, um, you can um, read more about it in my book. This book is actually coming out in about two weeks' time. This is actually the first proof copy, and I'm still yet to proofread it to, to tell the printers it's OK to print it. But in the meantime, there is actually a Kindle version out. And if you want a taster, if you go to my website, which is inflationmatters.com, you can actually get a free copy of um, the light version, which has got chapters one to seven in it. Okay, well, thank you very much for asking me to talk.